gladness. Christ is the solution for it all because Christ is the life. Christ is the truth. Always be centered in Christ. Christ in contrast to the religion. Religion. The Pharisees taught the religion, but Christ taught the way of life. They say, today we have got more Pharisees teaching religion only, not life. There is no life in religion, as I said last night. So there is no life in religion. Life is Christ. Anything which is not Christ is no life. It's only Phariseeism. So make a distinction between life and religion. <laughs> Of course, you know those truths before, but I'm only confirming it, the truth. We aren't hearing the truth, hearing it ten times, still better. I, you keep on telling the same thing to me every minute. I will love you for it, because I need to be told. I need to be constantly reminded. We all need it. That's why Paul meant comfort you one another with these things. I'm only comforting you. I'm comforting myself. That we should, all, we should never go out of the line. We should always be in the truth. Remain in the truth. For in the truth there is light and life. Outside truth there is only religion. And religion brings fear and chaos. Fear and chaos and distress. That's what religion does. That's what the Pharisees taught the sons in the East. Not to do anything to your daddy and mommy. If you do anything to daddy and mommy, you will be doing the will of God. If you want to evade supplying their need, you say it's carbon. False teaching. It's more false teaching today in the so-called churches. Because the truth, anything that is not Christ is false. All a lot of junk. So people are filled with junk today. No truth. So the Pharisees were doing, the Pharisees in Jesus' time are the same Pharisees in our time. The Pharisees never die. They're always alive. <laughs> They're always coming back, coming back to this world, misleading the world, upsetting the people of God, trying to deceive people. They're entering into the flock of God like wolves in sheep's clothing, trying to teach people the man's way, Pharisee's way, rather than the way of God. The way of God is Christ. Any other way is not the way of God. That was the reason I said, I think, I told you one time here in, in your church on the first game, Jesus drove the people out of the temple because uh, many Western people think that because they were exploiting the people. It isn't so. He drove them out of the temple because they were trying to find the entrance into the kingdom of God by doing things, by selling and buying. They were trying to earn salvation through their own way. That's why he drove them out. He said, he didn't drive them out for any other reason. That Christ came and told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto God but by me. But those people who are selling in the temple, they still persisted in gain, entering, gaining salvation through their good works. They rejected the only way to God. At the same time, they are trying to find another way to God, the way of selling and buying. You see, that way he drove them out. Many people preach the other way around. He drove them out because uh, they were exploiting the people, they were making money, or desecrating the temple. That is not so. You, have, don't, you don't have any authority, any verse of God of God to prove that point. He only drove them out because they are trying to get into the kingdom of God some other way. Any way which is not Jesus' way is not the way of God. Any way which is not the way of God is not Jesus' way. If you, if you don't believe in Jesus' way, you are trying to believe in some other way. Anybody who believes in some other way is a, is a thief and a robber. See, there are so many thieves and robbers inside the churches today as there were before. From the pulpit down to the membership, they're thieves and robbers. Because instead of accepting Christ as the only way to God, they're trusting in their own church membership, in their own good living and good, good thinking. Their own self-righteousness, which is a filthy rag. They were depending on rags rather than depend on the blood. 
Therefore, they, they, they were thieves and robbers. They were trying to enter the kingdom of God some other way. You see, you see, that's why he drove them out from the temple. You see, you go to a church, they preach different way because they want to confirm that you can be saved only by good works. They were doing good works in the temple. So if you do good works, you will be saved too. That's the, that's the way they teach some of them. But it isn't so. All our good living, good thinking, all our self-righteousness is as a filthy rag. You cannot go to God with rags on. You will have to put on a robe of righteousness which came to us by grace through faith from the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody who teaches contrary to that then is a way of thieves and robbers. Pharisees. Now, uh, that's what they were teaching uh, these, uh, these boys, you know. You make it the word of God of none effect. Of course, in the Western world, your philosophy is different. I don't want to change your philosophy here because uh, you don't have to. I'll tell you why. See, the culture of the Eastern world is different from the culture of the Western world. Culture means the way of life. And you have a marvelous way of life here. I know. Although that has nothing to do with the word of God. See, the Eastern culture has to do with the word of God. Because their culture, their way of life, their religion, which is their culture. The culture is the way of life. The religion and the way of life are one and the same in the East. In America, in the West, religion is for Sunday. Their way of life has nothing to do with, uh, with Christ. Much of it. Of course, if you are a believer in Christ, you live close to Christ. I know that. But the believers are far and between in America, in the Western world. They are only a very poor minority, very smallest minority. But the majority of the people, their culture has nothing to do with their religion. You know that. Yeah. Religion is for Sunday, their culture is for the rest of the week. But in the East, the religion and culture are one and the same. Now, supporting father and mother is a way of, is a religion, is a way. But it is not so in America. And it should be so either. I'll say, you mark my words. If it's not any clear, anything I say is not clear, you ask me a question. Because I want you to get the whole thing. I, you may be confused by certain statements I make, but wait until I finish. You see, your, your culture is for, so beautiful. If, if a man has got two sons, the father gives them education, right? According to the ability of the father. And then the sons go and get a job. They go on the, and they earn money. You see, father doesn't expect the son to bring money to his son, father. In America, it isn't so. You see, the father wants son to stand on his own feet, don't you? Let him earn the money, uh, let him find a girl for himself, let him get married, let him buy a home, let him buy furniture, let him settle down. I like to see him stand on his own feet. That's the fathers in the Western world think that way. Now, if I'm wrong in that, you let me know. I think I'm right there. The Bible says the fathers, the Bible says the fathers shall not, the sons shall not lay up for the fathers. The fathers should lay up for the sons. That's what the Bible says. But the Eastern culture says that if sons, sons should support their parents. The Western culture says no, the sons should support themselves. They stand on their own feet. That's the Western culture, which is beautiful. You don't have to follow Eastern culture, but you understand Eastern thinking. That's all there is to it. By understanding it, you will get the spiritual meaning. I never suggested that you should adopt Eastern way at all. I hope I never did. Eastern culture, you don't need it. But you must understand Eastern culture in order to understand the Bible. That's all. That's all my effort has been. 
I never introduce our way at all. Yeah, in America, man, uh, a man has got two, three sons. They all got a big, good education. One is an engineer, the other is a judge, the other is a lawyer. And get uh, fat salaries, make good living, good income. The parents uh, still live on old age pension, social security. Old, bald headed, crippled, uh, can't get up, can't walk. And uh, But son don't care for them. You see, they don't care for them. If they're sick, they put them in the nursing home. They won't take them to the home because the wives won't have them. You see? <laughs> I don't know if your culture is good or bad, but I don't think it's good anyway. <laughs> the wife won't have uh, well, You think I married you just to take care of her mother? No, 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 I married you because I want you, not your mother. As a Western culture. <laughs> I don't like that way at all myself. Uh, I think you, if you honor your father, your husband's mother, if you all and love her and uh, bless her and help her, God will bless you. That's our thinking. You see, that's our thinking. And I think you should think it should be the same. The law is the law, whether east or west, north or south. But much of your way I like, though. Very much so. But uh, you take what you, what you want. I said both cases to you. I stated both cases. But I like to say that people are made glad. Our parents must be made glad. Uh, at all time, to the best of our ability, they say. Although father and mother doesn't to, don't want to stop, stay with the sons. They're independent in America. They want to live by their own. They don't want to come to son's house. You see? But Eastern people, they want the son, the son takes his wife to the father's house to start with. They live with the father and mother because that's their culture, that's their way. You don't leave the father and mother because the wife won't have them. You see. They're foreigners to each other. They don't love them. You see. So they quarrel. You see. Mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, they quarrel here because they're two foreign people. In the East, mother-in-law, father-in-law can't afford to quarrel because they're blood relatives. Related by blood. See, That's why the wisdom of the East comes in the a practice. When they're blood relative, when, my, when I am a daughter-in-law, I've got a daughter-in-law, a mother-in-law, she's my related, my relation. I can't afford to quarrel with her. My daughter-in-law can't afford to quarrel with mother-in-law because they're blood relatives. Here in your case is different. You pick up anybody and everybody, you marry anybody and everybody. Therefore, the mother, the wife, <laughs> the daughter-in-law is a foreigner to the mother-in-law. Vice versa. I see your problem, you see. I see our problem also. So this is the way, however, as Christian people, as children of God, you and I, in Christ there is no east, no west, no north, no south, we are all one. Keep that in our mind. When you are a Christian, child of God, you love everybody. You love especially the household of faith. If a man does not provide for his own people, he is an, he, he, he is an infidel, Bible says. So if you don't provide for your own people, your own blood relatives, your own father and mother, we are infidel. Bible says that. So if your parents are in need, take care of them. Some of them are not in need, I know, in America, because they get their own home, their own farm, their own money, their own saving. You see? So you are all right in that way. I think we should learn a great deal from you. We, we should. I say. Because they're independent people, they're good, self-respecting people, they're realistic people. East, Western people are very real, realistic, they are. And I like them for it. But the Eastern people are very dependent on their sons, you see, because of their culture, but the training, I suppose, that has done them harm. There is harm and good in both ways. So let us follow as the Holy Spirit will lead us in each case. Let us not follow any country or culture. Let us follow Christ. Say what he tells us to do. And then we will do according to what our Lord tells us. A new creation. I think I, I, leave, it, I leave the matter there. So we will decide as the Holy Spirit leads us. According to the case. As the case may be. In each individual case. Well then uh, let us turn to the 
Book of Judges 11.35. It's a good one. I kept it in the last. I don't know if I preached in it when I was here last time. If I did, but we'll study it anyway. Book of Judges 11 chapter. 29th uh, uh, 31st verse. No, no, 30. No, Judges 11, 30, verse 30. I'll read for you. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whosoever, whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return, when I turn, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, that sh uh, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And verse 35, and it came to pass when he saw her that they rent his clothes. And said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, thou art one of them that troubled me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee uh, of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountain and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went, um, she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountain. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man, and it was a common custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. That's the story. I'll put them for you in the nutshell, for you, in my own words. You see, there was a war between Ammonites and uh, Israelites at one time. The leader under the Israelites was a man called Jephthah. Before he went to the battle against the Ammonites, he made a vow to God. Lord, if you give me victory over the Ammonites, when I come back from the battlefield victorious, anything that comes to meet me, I give that. Whatsoever comes to meet me, I'll give that unto you as a burnt sacrifice. That's a vow. All right, God granted the God granted the victory to this man. When he was coming back home, his only daughter, this man had only daughter, no son, no daughter, other daughter. She came with rejoicing to meet her victorious dad. And she brought the instruments of music to meet him on the road. And when he saw her, he rent his clothes, he said. By the way, you put down there, he rent his mantle, not clothes. Wherever you read rented clothes, you put down mantle, mantle. Nobody rents clothes. They rent a mantle. He rent his mantle. Why? Why? Is renting a mantle is an outward sign of inward anger or sorrow. In this case, not anger, but sorrow. Because he made a vow to God that anybody who comes from the family, to meet him, that he will give as a burnt sacrifice. He had got only one daughter, and she came to meet him. And when he saw her, he was troubled, he was, so, he was sorry that well, since he, she came, he must give her to God as a burnt sacrifice. So he rent his clothes, he rent his mantle to demonstrate his sorrow of his heart. And the girl knew what he meant. You see, he said, Alas, my daughter, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord. I cannot go back. 
She understood what he meant. She didn't explain to her. But he didn't, he didn't have to. She understood the case. Father, if you have opened your mouth unto the Lord, do it, what you said to God. But let me go and bewail my virginity for two months. And when I finish that, you, you do with me as you promised to God, she said. He said, go. What does it mean, bewailing of virginity? You must know that. See, any person, any woman who wants to give herself up to God, to serve God before marriage, the people who serve God in the temple must be virgins. You know, the nunnery came, nuns, Roman Catholic nuns, they are virgins when they give to themselves to God. So, this daughter was not married. She wanted to serve God. So, anybody who wants to serve God, they go take two months off before they join the temple. They go with their girlfriends to go to the mountains, have prayer meetings, consecration meeting, go and wish by wish goodbye to the relatives and friends, wish goodbye to the pleasures of this world and sanctify themselves and consecrate themselves for two months. That's a real um, way of doing things in the East. Any girl who wants to join the temple as a minister, she does that, bewailing a virginity for two months means consecrating themselves. Uh, to God and it takes two months time and they go with their girlfriends and have prayer meeting dedication meeting and, and the consecration meeting and so on and so forth and they prepare themselves in other words bewailing virginity may prepare themselves to join the temple to be a minister in the temple that's what bewailing of virginity means well uh, after the two months then the, the, the girl comes, the father takes her to the temple where she is going to serve. At the door of the temple, they shave off all her hair. That's what it happens to the girl. All the long hair the girls have, they shave off like the men shave the whiskers. That's at the door of the temple. And from there on, they put a veil on because there is no hair on the head. Therefore, they put the veil on. And the girl works in the temple night and day. She lives in the temple also. She works for the minister. She helps the pastor or the, church, the priest in the temple. That's why the kind of woman you read about her in Luke's Gospel, Anna, a woman was in the temple fasting and praying night and day. That kind of service in the temple. So those who join the temple, bewail virginity, and when they, on the day they join, they shave up all their hair. Now, now they have shaven up all their hair, they cannot pray without uh, uh, covering of the head. The covering of the head is the air of the woman. In those of you ladies, you have got covering. Covering is the air. All right. When you shave off the air as the Eastern woman do when they join the temple, then you must put a covering on the head. Because the air is being taken away, then you must cover the head with a hat or something. That's why they veil. Paul said, if a woman be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Eastern women are shaven when they, when they work in, in the temple. They must cover with a, with a veil. Western women are not shaven at all. They have got hair. They only cut the hair short. That's all. The Western women, such as you, are neither shorn nor shaven. They have got the hair as a covering. They don't need any hat on top of it. Because you have the air. Only when, when you don't wear, when you shave off the air like they do, then you cover the air with a hat. See the point there? In America, they're quarreling about these little things, you know. Mm -hmm. If a woman should wear a hat or a coat or what, and those things, uh, quibbling with the little things because they don't understand the culture, why and wherefore. So I gave you that light on you, for you. Now, what did Jeb Jephthah do with his daughter? Next question. He said, anything that comes to my home, I'll give it as a burnt offering. Burnt offering of two kinds. One, to kill on the altar. Another, uh, to give a, a girl alive to the temple to serve God. Any person who serves in the temple, 
um, and suffers humiliation and disgrace at the same time, that's also burnt offering. Any person who serves God while she is suffering, that's the cross. This person, any Eastern woman who joins the temple must not be married. To be unmarried is a disgrace in the East. That's the point. That's the burnt sacrifice of another kind. That I, if I have a daughter who chooses to serve in the temple, doesn't want to be married, then she is willing to suffer the shame and disgrace involved in being unmarried. That's in the Eastern society. It is not in the Western. So that's another kind of burnt sacrifice. Human sacrifice was forbidden, Paul, has been forbidden in the Bible. Uh, only one case of human sacrifice, which was attempted human sacrifice, that was the case of Abraham and Isaac. Before, when Abraham took his knife to slay his son, God said, slay not thy son. That's a question of test of faith. God does not pro pro provide human sacrifice at all. Therefore, this man gave his daughter as a living sacrifice, as a burnt sacrifice to serve in the temple and live in the temple the rest of her life and suffer shame and disgrace for being, not being married. For there is a shame and disgrace for a woman not being married in the East. You see, you don't have to follow Eastern culture again. You, I want you to understand what burnt sacrifice is. Since human sacrifice was forbidden, burnt sacrifice is to serve God as a living sacrifice, at the same time suffer shame and disgrace as the Eastern women do when they are not married and when they serve in the temple. Right. That's a clear language for you, isn't it? Good. What did Jephthah do with his daughter? He gave her, after two months of bewailing virginity, after she went through a consecration meeting, in other words, and he, he, he brought her to the temple and did with her according to his vow, it says. What means he gave her as a live, sac a living sacrifice to serve in the temple. That's what the living sacrifice is. That's what the burnt sacrifice is. Since uh, human sacrifice is forbidden, and this is a burnt sacrifice of another kind. Many Western commentators have been quibbling on it, even the fundamental Bible schools, you know, in this country, like uh, Asbury. There was a um, seminary in the Asbury in Kentucky where I preached. One of the students came to hear me in the Methodist church not long ago. And uh, he said, I wish you were there in seminary, Bishop, two years ago. Our professor read the chapter and he didn't give us any light because he didn't know. He said, I don't know what to say in this matter. I can't understand, he said. I wish you were there then, he said. Because I preached on this in this Methodist church. This student heard me on that. So even Asbury is sound college, you know, sound school. No, no two ways about it. I was there, I know. Even them are groping in darkness. Because they've never been able to understand the culture in it. That's why they're groping in darkness. So, bewailing of virginity, number one, and then giving her a, a live sacrifice, number two. They don't understand what it is to be unmarried in the East for a girl. What a shame and disgrace it is. They don't understand. And therefore, the last, the last what misleads them is this. Brother Beverly, the last word, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. They translated or concluded, when they translated this from Hebrew to, to Greek, uh, to, to English, they, they concluded, they judged on it, that the woman must have been sacrificed, killed. Therefore, they went yearly to lament you can only lament over somebody that's dead, isn't it? They took it for granted that the girl was given, uh, killed as a sacrifice. That's why they say 
lament. But you read in the, some of your translations, you might have, it, it, they went yearly not to lament, but to talk with the right translation. She was living, you got it? There you are, see? They come, to, they come with the truth sometimes, but they put the truth in the margin. They put a lie in the verse. It, uh, lamenting is a lie. Truth in the margin. Why do really they do? They want to save face. You see? They're too proud to accept the mistake. Why didn't they put in the in the mar in the in the West Fall? Tell me. Can you tell me why they didn't put? When they edit the new Bible, why did they put it in the they went to speak with instead of misleading the people? You see, they want to talk with some Bible say to celebrate. Even celebrate is not the right word. These four days in the year, the woman go to the temple, they see this girl. Oh Mary, what a wonderful girl you are. You kept up your daddy's promise to God. Eh? You could have argued with your daddy. Dad, I don't want you to make promise for me. I want to get married. I want to enjoy life. I'm a king's daughter. Uh, I don't want to suffer disgrace the rest of my life for not being married. Who told you to make a promise in my behalf, daddy? You, you have no business to do that. She, did, she could have argued with him. Couldn't she? Because she was an oriental girl, girl of the East, who has been trained to follow father and mother. You see, it's her culture. What father says is God's word. What mother says is God's word. That's where we're taught. So when mommy and daddy say, you take it from God. So when mommy and daddy said so, it is so. It's from God. For no man has seen God at any time. But if you don't love and obey your father and mother, you couldn't love and obey God, whom we didn't see. That being a philosophy of the Eastern people, the girl said, yes, daddy, whatever you said to God, go ahead and do it. Only let me go and bewail my virginity. She understood what he was going to say. They don't bewail virginity if they're going to kill her. You see the point? She understood. Why should they bewail virginity if the father was going to kill her? The girl was intelligent. She understood the custom before he explained to her. You see, the truth, the truth is apparent so beautifully here. Even from the girl. So why should she suggest be very, because she understood what he was going to do with it. See? Every girl who works in the temple must be well her virginity before she joined the temple. See? That's the consecration it is, you see. So every year, four days in the year, goes there go, girls go, and men, women go and talk to her, take fruits and flowers to her in the temple. Mary, what a wonderful girl you are. I wish I was like you. I am involved in this world. I am married. I got children. I have got this worry and that worry. You are free. You are carefree because you chose to serve God. I wish I was like you. I wish there are more daughters like you. That's the way they talk. They talk to her and praise her and comfort her and uh, make her glad. That's the way they do. They will go to talk with her, not to lament. She is not dead to lament. She is alive, living. You see. Now that, that case is clear for you now. Now you can preach. You can go to all seminaries in this country and talk on this. I preached on this in the Presbyterian Church in California. You know the man, uh, Hollywood Presbyterian Church, heard of it? Hollywood. In my folder is that man's son's testimony is here. Oh, I see. He's not here. He took away that thing. Paul played tricks, you know. You know what Paul does, you know? He doesn't want to print the testimonies behind. If he did, and uh, if he did, he didn't want to. If they see too many Baptists, Methodists won't have me. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, not this Paul, the other Paul, Crockett. He's a Methodist, you know. So he printed without my testimony in the back. <laughs> <laughs> to give to the Methodists. <laughs> How crooked you are to be in this world diplomatic. <laughs> uh, I was looking for the testimony of the you know, Presbyterian at the back. You know, you saw that, didn't you? Louis Evans. Louis Evans Sr. is the minister of the Hollywood, the famous Presbyterian church in Hollywood, Los Angeles. 
He is a very great preacher of the Presbyterian Church today. He is a leading man in that denomination. He came here I mean, in his son's church in Los Angeles. He came into the big man. He came and sat there with his wife. So he had a daughter who was uh, in a wheel bath chair. She is a lame girl. And um, he sat next to her. I saw him come and I saw him sit there with his wife and next to his daughter. So after he finished, uh, uh, after I finished speaking, he had to go away. He whispered to his daughter, tell the bishop he ruined my sermon. Because I have been talking to the people all my life that Jephthah killed his daughter as a sacrifice. And the bishop says he didn't kill her at all. And so he ruined my sermon now. What I'm going to do now? <laughs> so he told his daughter, and daughter told me to tell, daddy told me that he ruined his sermon. So Dr. Ironside, you know, in Moody Church, Chicago, one of the great scholars, he is in glory now. And many of his sermons were ruined too by me. You say, because he taught one way, I taught him another way. You say, you say, that's why no use of uh, sticking the old stuff. When you, when you get the light, you better change. Why you hang on to the dead stuff? Why you why live in the old, oh, the, oh, in a lie? Why don't you live in the truth? See, if you know the truth, get, get the truth. No mind what you were taught before. You say, find the truth. If you say she was killed, you have got no legs to stand on because the Bible forbids human sacrifice. Right. God is not a liar. God is not two-faced. God is only one face. God is the truth. God is the truth from cover to cover in the Bible. If what you say doesn't agree with the rest of the scripture, you should quit preaching. If what you say agrees with the rest of the scripture, that's the truth. So you better preach the truth. Uh, not uh, um, half a truth, but the full truth. Every year they went to lament it. Say, they went to speak with. I did not know it was to speak with in some Bibles until recently I found out. Somebody told me they speak with there. I am glad that at least they have got that much courage to print in the margin the truth. Say. However, the, in closing I would like to say a few words on the 35th verse. Same chapter. Book of Judges, 11th chapter, 35th verse. I want to say, make comment or two for our benefit tonight before we go home. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes, he put down, rent his mantle, and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that troubled me. He meant I have to do what I promised. For I opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. That's what he said. What did he open his mouth unto the law? That he will give anybody who comes out of his home to meet him. That he will give to God as a burnt sacrifice. That's what he opened his mouth and said to God. And he says now, now that she came only daughter, and uh, he saw what he should do now, and he was very, very sad. Now, although he was sad, that his daughter made, made, made him, came to meet him, he would not open, he opened his mouth, he won't change. He can't go back on his word. Why did he not go back on his word? How many times have we made a promise to God? How many times did we go back on our word, you and I, since we have been Christian? Why did we not go, why, how many times did we go back on our word? Can you count? You can't even count. There are so many times. How many times did you make a promise to God that you will love him and serve him all your lifetime and we did not serve him as we promised? How many times did we say we give tithing and offering to God and we gave two weeks and quit the third week? How many times did we sing all to Jesus and surrender? We never intended to surrender. We sang a lie. How many, why, why did we change? Because we were not salted and swaddled. This man being a king, an oriental, he was salted when he was born and swaddled to speak the truth. 
Anything you say, must you must do. Anything, any word who comes out of your mouth, you must do, no matter what they cost. That's the philosophy of these people. And they stuck by their word, no matter what it cost them. So we have not been salted in swaddle, and therefore we say anything in Galilee, and no intention of keeping our word. This is the message for you and for me as Christian people tonight in closing. We are going to repent. We are going to think when we go home. You better think. Go, let your mind go back. Your mind is more loyal to you than you are. The mind will bring back to your mind all the things that you said in, in the years gone by. Even the last month, even the last week. All the things that never intended to keep. Bring those things to your mind. Take a little time. Oh, such may, oh God, my actions try. If there is any wicked, wicked way of unbelief or disobedience in my heart and mind, please reveal it to me. Any words I have broken to you, any word which I said I have no, I no intention of doing, oh Lord, reveal it to me. You go to bed with that thought. And the th these, these, th these things will come back to you by the flood, like flood. Because there are too many. And count them, you can't count them. Too many times we may open our mouth and broke it. Because we are not salted in swaddle. And this time we are going to begin with God. After this confession, after this searching ourselves. Take little time tonight as you go home, search. And they'll all come like flirts, picking your conscience. So many times you said this to God, you never kept it. So many times did, so many times made sacrifices, consecration meeting, uh, walked in revival meeting, put up your hand, cried, and this, done that, but never kept a word. Think of all those things. And then uh, uh, asking God to cleanse you from all, all those sins. And then to make up your mind, Lord, now I have got salt in me. I'm going to only say those things what I'm going to do. Now tonight, Lord, I'm going to surrender myself to you completely. And I'm going to remain surrendered. And do, and do thy will from now on. I will never go back on my word. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my pocketbook, let it be consecrated, dedicated to thee. Take my home and let it be consecrated to thee. Take my talents, everything I have, consecrated to thee. From here on, I belong to you. Uh, not only I, but all that belongs to me, belong to you. Uh, let me be a loyal and faithful steward to you. Something must happen, Brother Beverly. Brother Beverly and I have been talking when you were drinking coffee. Three or four of us were taught. What is that? Why we don't do what we say? Why? Uh, because we, we are not salted. Because we know it, we, 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 Christ is not real to us. If Christ is real as, as this book is, then you will say what you mean and do what you mean. Because Christ to us is not a real person. It may be that. Or to you, to us, who is Christ is real, then we have no, we have no word of honor. Why? Because we are gullible. We have never been trained properly, maybe. Or why are we not trained now? Why don't we do, why don't, why don't we make up our mind to be loyal now? Jesus said, Paul said, have salt in yourself. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Do what you say. Why don't we? Ah, this is the point. This is the crux of the matter of all my talk. I come back to the same point every time I talk. That's all the message. That's all my vision is. My vision, that much preaching has been done. Too much preaching has been done in the world. Too much. And we're very little practice. 
Much preaching, little practice. Preaching, preaching, no practice. Why? We never intended to. We are afraid to, to practice. We think it, will, it won't work. It won't work. It won't work. We have made up our mind that it won't work to serve the Lord. It won't pay us. Made up our mind. Unconsciously inside. Deep down in our heart. We made up our mind that we shouldn't do what Christ taught us. If we do, it may, we will fail. We will be broke. That kind of thing has gotten under our skin. It's there, hiding there, hiding in our cell, uh, unconsciously. It is there. And we, tonight, we should bring it out. That cursed thing of unbelief. The cursed thing of disobedience inside of us, lurking inside. Bring it out to open and face it and destroy it and bury it and let Christ have his own way with us. Either we serve him or we don't. This man said, he was a king, wasn't he? He had only one daughter. It's a disgrace to the throne. The girl is not only, not only disgraced in the temple, but disgraced to the throne. His subjects will dishonor him because his only daughter was not married. They think a curse of God was on the family, on the throne. Could he not have made a compromise with God? Lord, I'm sorry I made the promise. Flesh is weak, Lord, spirit is willing. So, you know, Lord, I can't be bothered. I can't face the world. If I give my daughter, I'll be in disgrace. Poor child, she did not do any harm. Why should I make her suffer, Lord? Please, Lord, forgive my weakness. I'll give a million dollars to you, Lord, as a bribe. Will you save me, Lord? Forget it, Lord. Write a check for the missionaries in Africa. You know, that will cover my sin. But don't bother me, Lord, to do what I promised to my daughter. I love that child, only child I have. I wanted to get her married to a prince, live in throne, in pleasure. She deserves it. Lord, what a sin I committed. I opened my mouth, oh Lord, but forget it. You know, Lord, flesh is weak, spirit is willing. Eh? That's what we pray, don't we? We always hide under the flesh, weak, flesh <laughs> is weak, spirit is willing. So, Lord, you are going to forgive me anyway. So, you forget all about it. I'll go in my own sweet way. I'll be, I was born a liar. I remain a liar. So, Lord, forget about it. Anyway, you're going to take me to heaven anyway when I'm dead. He could talk like that. He could have, couldn't he? But he did. He said, my daughter, I'm very sorry. I opened my mouth unto the Lord. I cannot go back. It's impossible for me to go back. And if you make a promise to God tonight, all to Jesus, I surrender, shall we mean it? Shall we do it? As you do so, God will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you to prove his faithfulness. If you are faithful to him, he will be faithful to us. So, my dear friend, this has been a burden on my heart. When I, when I told Brother Beverly to him, you know, when you went to drink coffee, that he sat here. And uh, Brother Beverly, what is the solution? We don't seem to make people, inspire people to do the will of God. They hear a good sermon, they say, praise God, it's a wonderful message. They say that much. But as soon as they go out of the door, they finish. They have no intention of doing the will of God at all. They say, and they hide in the weakness. What shall we do, Brother Beverly, to make the people walk with God? Well, he said, I've been waiting for that too for the last 10, year, ten years, he said. I am waiting on the Lord also. What it is that we should do to the people to walk in the will of God? Why? How? How can we do that? I've been waiting for light, he said. Well, I've not been waiting for 10 years, I said to him. But I've been waiting quite for some time. Why? If I, if, if I can't do the will of God, 
as a born again, as a child of God, as a spiritual man of God, if I can't do the will of God, walk in the will and abide in the will, go with Christ, no matter what it may come, would you expect the man on the street, a drunk, a thief, a liar, will do will of God? No, he's a foreigner to Christ. He couldn't. We are not foreigners to Christ. We are children. As children, we have the power. The man on the street hasn't got the power. And the man who is a religious man, who burns incense and crosses, crosses himself 25 times a day, goes for mass every morning in the morning, uh, goes, he's a religious man only. He has no power. But we are spiritual. We have the power of God. We are not we, but Christ. Well, if Christ in us and gives us power to do, why don't we? I want to send you home with this thought. You put the question to yourself, why don't I? If I've not been giving the tithing and offering, why don't I start tonight? Don't pray, I am weak, Lord, I am poor, Lord, I've got bills to pay, Lord. Don't bring all that junk, who have said that before. You opened your mouth, didn't you? If you don't want to do, don't say I surrender to God. Don't say that. Don't why prove ourselves a liar. Something must be done. And that something is, step on the gas. Do it. This man said, I opened my mouth to draw unto the Lord, I cannot go back. Shall we all say the same? I opened my mouth unto the Lord. I say, Lord, tonight, search me, O God. My actions try. If there is any wicked way of unbelief, disobedience in my heart, in my life, cleanse me, O Lord. I am very sorry. Now I am going to open my mouth by thy power, by thy grace, and I am going to do it. No matter what the cost, I may have to give my daughter alive, I may have to my son alive, I may have to lose my life, I may have family, my heart, no matter what it may be, but I am going to do what I said I will do. This is what we should do. Then you see the hand of God, power of God, moving us. You can see the feel the hand of God, moving us, blessing us. Cheering us, strengthening us. The world will see what we are doing. Let us pray. Now you really mean to God what you are going to say. Lord, we are very sorry. I am sorry, Lord. I come to you with a broken and a contrite heart. That I have failed you. My words meant nothing. My consecrations meant nothing. My surrender meant nothing. Because I've never been salted and swaddled to be faithful to you. Now you said, Lord, have salt in yourself. I thank you. Give me grace, O Lord, and thy power, so I may not be hearers of the word only, but the doers of the will of God from now on. We open our mouth unto the Lord. All I have, I give to thee. I've said it, and I'm going to do it, no matter what it might cost. With this, with this conviction, with this determination, by thy grace, O Lord, may we go forward tonight and be changed and transformed by the renewal of our mind, that we may be established in the faith, and made strong, that we may see the hand of God moving, and the light of God shining in our pathway, and the joy of the Lord filling our minds and hearts. Go, oh Lord, do something new for us tonight. Who beseech thee, for Christ's sake. Amen.